But, uh, but we still have some exciting material to cover and uh, uh, on two different levels. I want to talk today for the next hour or so uh, on scaling on-chain as well as scaling off-chain. And uh, so you heard some talks about this and now you should, you should hear a little bit about the work that we've done in this space. So, okay, so everybody now agrees that blockchains are limited in scale. For the longest time, I used to get pushback on this slide. Some people would get very, very upset when I said things like Bitcoin is limited, inherently limited uh, in scale. But even the core folks now are admitting that, indeed, this thing is currently puttering along at 3.5 TPS uh, with latencies in the tens of, of minutes. And uh, if you, you, know, you could reparameterize. So how could you reparameterize? You could make the blocks larger or you could make the block rate higher. The two things are essentially isomorphic, and th there are umpteen different ways in which you could phase in a change to the protocol. So there have been many Bitcoin improvement proposals uh, about how to exactly make these blocks larger. And you know, behind this picture, you see a bike shed. Uh, I don't know if people are familiar with that phrase in, in English. Um, usually this is referring to the fact that, uh, that uh, in town halls, people fight to the death about what color a bike shed should be painted on, painted in, right? So, uh, you know, you want to do something nice and you say something like, let's, you know, let's, uh, let's go and build a bike shed. And then suddenly you're in for a ginormous fight on exactly what color the bike shed should be. So the problem with the Bitcoin bike, bike shed and in general, the blockchain or Nakamoto consensus bike shed is there is a, there is a big trade off underneath and what's that trade-off? As you make blocks larger, you impact decentralization. The network tends to be more and more centralized. And that's because of, of two things. Um, if you have larger blocks, they take longer to propagate. Um, or if you have more frequent blocks, then uh, they are much more likely, you're much more likely to uh, have two different blocks discovered at the same time. Both of these lead to more forks. Forks lead to uh, losses of energy. They they uh, <coughs> they yield um, less security for the chain, and uh, it gives an incentive to people to coalesce their forces to create bigger uh, bigger um, mining entities together. It's surprising, isn't it? So. Um, uh, it was surprising to me as well that we are stuck with one megabytes per second. One megabyte is one floppy disk, right? Those of us who dealt with floppies. So there's one floppy every 10 minutes. And, um, and uh, so, uh, okay, what's there to say? Um, it's surprising. And this was a fight that was fought to death. It ended, in, uh, it ended the careers of at least two rather productive people. Um, there's many more. Like, uh, so... Um, so uh, it caused a big shift in the community. Bitcoin forked into two different communities called Bitcoin Cash versus Bitcoin. Um, and uh, it's, it's ridiculous, right? I'll show you some numbers that show that you could easily make these, you could have made these blocks much, much bigger without any kind of a, uh, without any kind of a real centralization pressure. Um, so, you know, okay, if you leave the, big, the, the actual absolute numbers aside, there is merit in this argument. You cannot make these blocks arbitrarily large. That should be apparent to everyone. So this same con man who has hired this whole PR apparatus to attack me and other people, um, he's talking about gigabyte blocks. Okay, so if you made, made these gigabytes long, you're not going to be able to download a gigabyte in 10 minutes. And <coughs> therefore, the person who found the block has an advantage. They, they get to go before everybody else. So there is a fundamental problem here. Um, What's, uh, what's not so clear is, um, is how to move forward. How do we break out of this, this, this dilemma? So where do we set the, you know, so one megabyte is too small, I agree. Um, you know, 10, 10 megabytes is probably okay. I don't know, like this is like, you know, designed by gut feel, right? So um, this is not how we should be building systems. You shouldn't be reaching into your gut and feel like, you know, 32 megabytes is probably a good number, right? I mean, where do you put the mark, right? So that's really the big problem. So uh, let's see. So, okay. So everybody knows about fork resolution in Bitcoin and, uh, you know, the longest, heaviest rules. I'm not going to bother you with all this stuff. Um, so I want to show you essentially um, a completely different way of 
redoing Nakamoto consensus that gets us out of this stupid problem. Okay? We're going to, my goal was, I, I want to sidestep this ridiculousness. I don't want to have this fight. I don't want to have to select these parameters. These parameters are, um, uh, are uh, uh, you know, they're very hard to, to, to select, and then there's a big fight being, uh, being fought over them. Perhaps we can do something smart that allows us to sidestep the entire discussion. And uh, so I'll, sh I'll tell you what that is. And, uh, and in, the, in the process, um, we did a bunch of other work. I, I kind of like this paper because it allowed us to touch just about every level of, uh, of sort of discourse um, around sort of building systems. So we had a protocol, but then... We were like, okay, so we have something better, but on what metric is it better? What are the metrics that ought to matter for a consensus protocol? So we had to come up with a few. Um, and then how do you actually evaluate these things? So we built an entire evaluation testbed. We built a measurement testbed to parameterize the evaluation testbed. So I'll talk a little bit about those. Um, I'll spend a tiny bit of time on those, but they're, they're kind of neat. Let me first give you the big intuition. So what's the intuition? So if you look at a blockchain, here is our miner, uh, here is our blockchain being extended in this direction. These are blocks with tra transactions in them. What's really going on when we're doing this mining thing? What's going on is every 10 minutes, so in between blocks, we're kind of sitting here, right? We're just like, hey, I heard Alice paid Bob. I heard Charlie paid David. Now that's kind of happening at a constant rate. And that is what it is. That's fine. And then on occasion, Morris says, I found a block, and then we go crazy. I have to take that block from him as soon as possible and build on it. And Luber is trying to do the same thing because, you know, we actually paid a lot of money for these mining rigs. We have costs to pay. We want to get going. So it's a weird protocol. It gets really frantic every 10 minutes or so. And in between, it's kind of sitting quiet there. So, um, and what's going on really when Morris says, I found a block? Well, there are two things going on. He's, this is his block, and, uh, and really he's saying two things. One, he says, I am the leader. I've got the conch. I'm going to speak now. I have the right to speak by virtue of having found a proof-of-work puzzle. And then he says, by the way, I, the leader, declare that in the last 10 minutes, the following transactions took place in the following order. So he's doing transaction serialization as well as leader establishment at the same time. And the key insight for Bitcoin NG is, well, can we break apart these two separate concepts such that we restructure the protocol and get out of this whole business of, of issuing these gigantic blocks? Right? We'd like to make them really big, but, but if we're going to get frantic about all like this whole dissemination thing, we don't want them to be big, da, 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 da. it gets kind of complicated if, if you try to push this model. Maybe we can do something better. And so, uh, so pictorially, I think this is what it's showing. I've got all these transactions here. I've got my proof of work puzzle there. And uh, maybe I break them apart. And, uh, and so this is the leader election part. This is the serialization part. So, uh, um, so how does this, uh, well, what happens? If you make the block size really big, then you get high throughput. That's wonderful. If you make the block frequency uh, very high, then you get low latency. That's also wonderful. But both of these lead to high forks, and that's bad. So what you really want to do is sort of find some way of having less forks while you have high throughput and low latency. That's what we're going to try to achieve. So uh, the core idea I already blurted out uh, already, which is decouple the leader election, leader election from transaction serialization. So Morris is going to say, guys, I'm the leader. And then we're going to do some magic uh, to get this, these three nice properties. It's going to be high throughput, low latency, and it should be secure. What does secure mean? It should retain all of the properties of regular Bitcoin. It should uh, retain all of the properties of, of uh, the mining rigs, all of the expenditures and capital that went into securing Bitcoin, and give us a much better performing, uh, performing uh, uh, protocol. So how shall we do this? <laughs> Let me illustrate how we could do this. So take these blocks, these, these ginormous big things, and, uh, and observe that the blocks are retrospective. 
So essentially, Morris is saying, I'm the leader, and I'll tell you what happened in the past. Break it the other way. So turn it around so that, I don't know what the opposite of retrospective is, futurospective. Okay, so it's a different kind of a protocol that looks forward. So Morris says, I'm the leader now, and from here on out. And then, as transactions come in, he immediately adds them to the block on the fly. Does that make sense? That's what we're going to try to do. So here is the key idea. We take the big block, we take just the proof of work part, and we, we make it, it, it its own thing used for leader election. We're going to call that a key block. Inside, it's going to have a, a crypto key, just like the Coinbase key. Uh, it's going to have a crypto key that, that, I, that belongs to the miner. And then, these transactions that we're sort of talking about what happened in the past, uh, we're not going to be doing them that way. <coughs> these transactions will be added to our blockchain as they happen by virtue of being signed by the guy who mined the last key block. Okay? So miner mines a key block, and then he starts minting these transactions. So Morris goes, hey, I'm the leader. Alice paid Bob, Charlie paid David, da 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 da. And then I say, hey, Morris, stop. Right after Charlie paid David, I became the next leader, and I'm going to start minting. That's the trick. And uh, questions already, or just stretching? Okay. Yeah. Of course, it's a huge problem. Yes, yes, it will be a big problem. So uh, um, let me show you all of the problems that, that will... So the biggest problem is... Uh, well, we'll talk about all the problems. Now, there, it's not trivial, right? The, the idea seems trivial at first, but if you try to flip it, flip the block creation, well, what's the hash of a block, right? Well, where do I hook what in? And why would somebody hook to the end of what Morris is creating as opposed to uh, taking away all the transactions that that he is minting. So getting the incentives right is going to be quite, quite difficult. Not quite difficult, well, it's going to require some thought, okay? And there are all sorts of selfish mining type attacks that uh, I mentioned earlier, also possible here, we want to rule those out. So, uh, okay, so the connection between key blocks, we'll, we'll get to them in a few, a few slides. So we, the connection between key blocks and micro blocks is simply that there's a, there's a key here, and that key is used to sign all these micro blocks and create a nice, well-ordered blockchain uh, the thing to notice here is that, uh, that um, uh, the key blocks are very small and they're rare. They happen every 10 minutes. And they happen using the regular old PAL machinery. So if you bought a lot of mining rigs, you're melting the polar ice caps and so forth, you're doing all that, you don't have to change what you're doing. So this is a big selling point, um, sad <coughs> as it is. And then the micro blocks are small and they're very frequent. So in essence, what we're doing is we're taking this block creation process we're smearing it across time. Morris is just generating that block as it happens, as the transactions come in, as opposed to you know, sitting there collating transactions for 10 minutes but without saying anything, and then suddenly blurting out, guys, these are the 10, 10 I picked. Instead of that, we're just going to sp uh, spread it over time, and that's going to give us much better behavior at the network layer. Okay. So how does that look? It looks kind of like this. Suppose this is the tail of my blockchain, this green thing. Uh, what happens is I go, as a miner, I go and solve a proof of work puzzle. And uh, it has that here, and I put a key in it, the key that I identifies the blue miner. So that then establishes the blue miner as the next, mi next miner that has the right to mint microblocks. From that point on, so that establishes the leader election. Uh, from that point on, this blue miner is capable of issuing micro blocks that each contain a, a single transaction or two. So as these transactions are streaming in, he takes them, signs them, attaches them to the blockchain by mentioning the previous hash of, uh, of either a micro block or a key block. So this gets extended by the blue miner. This is our transaction serialization. And, uh, and at some point, a new miner can come in and hook themselves in. And here is the yellow miner coming in, and she says, okay, I've got a key block, and, uh, and goes and hooks herself here, and starts minting yellow, yellow, uh, yellow micro blocks. And of course, in so doing, just like every other blockchain protocol, the tail of the blockchain is a scratch space. So we might lose some of these items, but it's going to turn out that that's not that big a deal. 
So far, so good. This is sort of the crux of the of the protocol. Okay. So, yes. Miner picks them just like they picked before. How does a miner pick transactions for his block to, to, to include in his block? Yeah. Right now, they currently what they do is they have 10 minutes to sort all of the transactions by highest fee per byte. And here, uh, they're, they're free to do anything at all. They can just put transactions on the, on the, the, the chain as they come in. Uh, or they could actually wait a little bit, pick, pick the high value ones and put them on whatever they want to do. Oh, this yellow? Yeah. We want her to hook in at the tail end of the longest chain. Yeah. So we don't want, but she could play funny tricks. And I'll talk about the funny tricks. We don't want her playing those funny tricks. <laughs> OK, yes? So the square, uh, every 10 minutes? Mm -hmm. Squares come every 10 minutes. And, uh, every two seconds. Every Somewhere there. I can send you 200 bytes every two seconds. You'd be fine. Right? It's actually very, very good to have it that way. Uh, ultimately, in between those 10 minutes, I'm going to send you a block's worth of data. How big will that block be? I don't know. It depends on what the block inter-arrival time is. And it can be very large, but we, we don't have to be idle. As long as this, this miner is well-intentioned, he is going to fill that time with as many transactions as he can. It's kind of cool. We just sidestep that entire craziness of, I don't know how many people really witnessed that block size debate, but it was maybe two or three years of practitioners going crazy. And, and really, we didn't have to do any of that. Yes? If uh, tiny blocks come every two seconds, isn't, aren't miners incentivized to just point to the latest key block instead of every two seconds? We don't want that. Yeah. Exactly. Very insightful, but we definitely don't want them doing that. I'll show you how not. And that's going to be the central difficulty with this scheme. Yeah. Just the key. Just the ECDSA public key. Yeah. Actually, to be really specific, it contains a Coinbase transaction. So you're minting, minting new coins in the key block as well as specifying a key. So you get new, blo new keys. You get new coins for having minted a new key block. And what? And the, and the POW, POW puzzle is there, the timestamp is there. Everything that used to be in the block header is still there. Uh, the Coinbase transaction is there, and then nothing else is there. OK. Yeah? Won't the fees go to zero because there is no cost? Like, the miners additional cost to include the fee. There's no cap. There's no one megabyte. Fees should, go, should get much lower, but uh, they're not going to go to zero. If the, uh, uh, the arrival rate of transactions is uh, higher than what the network can bear, then, the, trans then the, the miner should act as a leaky bucket, collecting them and then emitting only the high fee ones. Is there a question? I'll yeah, take the question. The, the proof of work. Yeah. On, on which block uh, do you mine the, the new, yeah, the new key yellow? Yeah. This is the one that has the PAL. And it has the key that will mint the, the micro blocks. On which block? What does that mean? It's yeah. Previous hash is this one. Oh, this. this. A, micro, a micro block. That's okay. right. Yeah, exactly. Yes? Is there any limitation on how many micro blocks can be between blocks, or just as many as the network can handle from a congestion point of view? There, there should be a protocol enforced limit. Yeah. So, uh, um, OK. Yeah. Ignoring the limit, then you ignore his micro blocks. He oh oh uh, somebody could mine a block, mine just a key block, and never bother with micro micro blocks. Yeah. Absolutely true. In the very same way that a miner today could mine just an empty block and never bother to put anything else in. So there are lots of incentives for why the miners won't do that, and they don't do that, right? Because that doesn't help the system along. It doesn't help their own coins gain value. 
And uh, uh, it's just, uh, yeah, but they could do that here. We're open to it just like Bitcoin is open to it. So this, the correctness criteria for Bitcoin NG is very well specified. Assuming Bitcoin works correctly, Bitcoin NG will <coughs> work correctly. Okay, so uh, it's everything we do here is going to be isomorphic to a, to a scenario in Bitcoin. So you will probably will come up with other bad scenarios for every single one of them. There's a corresponding one in Bitcoin in the first place. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, okay. And you can, you can basically trade your throughput uh, with latencies and the, the whole system will be healthy at the basic level. So why, why people just do not uh, incorporate this principle? Uh, so that's a very good and very interesting conversation that we should have. So the, for, I think as I understand the question, uh, is well, how should we select um, transactions for uh, inclusion? What should be the criteria? What's best for the system? And um, uh, and uh, we're, we are doing some ongoing research right now on exactly this. The answer turns out that whatever Bitcoin is doing, whatever any cryptocurrency is doing, which is uh, selling, selling space and blocks to transactions based on fees, is the wrong thing to do. And um, so, uh, uh, but that's a separable, separable concern. So maybe uh, if there's time at the end of this, uh, we'll have that conversation. I'm super excited about that topic because I'm actively working on it. Um, but uh, let me finish Bitcoin Engine, maybe tomorrow or something. I'll, I'll talk about it more. Okay, so uh, let's get the reward structure uh, down for this. So that's going to, the incentivization is going to be the hardest thing. So how, how are people incentivized to do anything in Bitcoin? Well, there, there are two things that pay them. There's this Coinbase transaction in every, in every uh, block. And the Coinbase transaction uh, gives somebody two things. You get a reward for minting the block, a block reward. It's a fixed amount. It used to be 50 coins per block, went down to 25. It's currently 12 and a half BTC. That's what you get. Plus, you collect all the transaction fees that are in your block, okay? All of them. You mine that block, everything in it is yours. The reward structure in, in Bitcoin NG is going to have to necessarily be different. So... The, um, the, the minting fee that you used to collect, you still will get to collect. Okay, that is not changing. So 12 and a half BTC is yours when you, mine a, when you mine a key block. That's the easy part. Transaction fees, though, are different. Okay, if the transaction fees went in full to the person who, who found the preceding key block, then you have a problem. You have this problem where that yellow person who was coming here, um, she would have just taken all these feet. Like she, there was no, she has no incentive to, to respect any of the micro blocks you built. She'd be like, okay, well, you've done a, a fat lot of work over there. I want those fees. And she would just come in and, and steal all of them. So that's not good. So we don't want to have that happen. So how are we going to do that? That's really, that's really the issue. So, um, so... So we want, so, so she has you know, essentially two sensible things she can do. She can try to hook to the key block and uh, make this block empty and steal these transactions, or she can hook into the end of this. And uh, there's a very simple way by which you could, uh, you could force her to, uh, to want to extend the, the tail as opposed to hooking in and stealing these transactions. And what's that? It's give her, give her more money, right? So, uh, so here's how we do it. So the transaction fees in a micro block are split. Some of them go to the person in the front. Some of the fees go to the person that comes afterwards. And um, as long as, so we're going to call this part our leader, our leader, this amount. Um, so he is going to make the our leader fraction. And one minus our leader is going to go to the red person. 
And uh, as long as r leader is less than 0.5, then it's clear what you want to do. You want to just go and hook yourself to the right to this location. Easy peasy, yes? OK. So we fixed at least that problem. Um, so, uh, so let's see if there are other problems. Well, I, 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 uh, I should have asked you guys what. Um, here, I'll go back. Uh, eyes up here, don't look at the slide. Um, so what are the other problems that you can see? There's, there should be one other problem. Red should be constantly trying to mine a key block. Yeah, so, but the problem, so, there, there is like a trade-off, right? So, if you wait uh, more time, so someone, uh, someone steal our, uh, our micro, micro blocks before, or we have to wait, or we have to like, start mining so at, at, uh, as fast as possible. Uh, you should, the red, red has every incentive to start mining as fast as possible. And she will, she will mine at the tail of, uh, of the micro blocks as they come out, right? So she discovers them and she's like, oh, there's another fat, fat transaction fee. I want my majority share of it, so I will just bump my pointer, bump my pointer. And now I got lucky and I'm like, okay, I've got a block. So that, well, that part works okay, but you guys all heard the selfish mining talk, so tell us. Yes, yes, okay. The front row, front row is good. Well, well, Aviv had to leave for, where is Aviv? Yeah, he had to leave for, uh, for, to pick up his kids, I think. So we should form a company and, uh, yes, make money afterwards. Uh, but here, we have, a, we have a young person. Yeah, you, what were you going to say? Selfish mining? Yeah, there is a selfish mining equivalent, which is um, you hide your own micro blocks. Okay, so, so instead of, uh, uh, so here's the trick. So I'm the leader. I don't issue any micro blocks. I just sort of mint them in private. And then... If I get lucky again, then I, get, I, I cover both sides and I get 100% of the transaction fees in those blocks. Is that clear? Let me show it pictorially maybe. So uh, what are the two cases? Um, so, uh, uh, so yeah, I think, uh, um, uh, right, I think it's this case. So, uh, um, so what I want to do, maybe I should start with this. Okay, um, let's see. Okay, yeah, this is, this is the way this goes. This applies to this scenario, and this equation applies to this equation. So I'm going to set up, in, in trying to figure out what this R leader parameter ought to be, in trying to figure out how the transaction fees should be split, uh, what we are going to end up doing is setting up two inequalities, and those inequalities will constrain what the R leader ought to be. And uh, it'll turn out that uh, uh, there's a particular selection that works fairly nicely. And, uh, and that's going to give us a, a workable, workable set. So I think this is the easy one. We want this red person to hook to the end of the longest chain. So I talked about that before. And uh, so this should pay more than that. And, uh, and so that is simply this equation, this inequality. And uh, it tells us that extending the longest chain should have a payoff that, uh, that, that is better than uh, not extending the longest chain and taking it for yourself. And uh, this is the, um, the other scenario where uh, I'm the one who mined the first block. I kept all the micro blocks to myself in the hope that I mine the next block. And so, so that... Uh, should, uh, should pay less than, uh, uh, than, uh, than me uh, making them public and extending whoever it is that came after them. Okay, so those are the two scenarios. That's another equation over there. And if you set them up, uh, this one constrains, uh, uh, and our leader has to be less than 0.5, uh, you get a feasible region that's uh, somewhere between 0.39 and 0.49. And our leader, so we set our leader to 0.40. And uh, that's a perfectly fine choice. Gives us both of the, the properties that we want. You, don't, you have no incentive to hold the blocks for yourself. And you have every incentive to extend somebody's longest chain. Yes? No, not at all. Um, like, 
So this is what would happen. The, the heaviest chain rule would apply. So where is this? I have a better picture that shows this. Um, I guess when I'm connected to the screen, it goes slower. Just a sec. Uh, here we go. This is the one I wanted. So hang on. Oh, God. Stop it. Stop this. We're going to the beginning of time here. Come on. I've had terrible luck on this trip. Oh, we're really going to the beginning of time. Okay, um, it's doing. <laughs> we're going to end on. Oh, this is. What a disaster. Stop it. Okay, um, so I just wanted to say uh, that. Um, okay, suppose there's a, there's a long, long chain. There's, suppose there's a long chain and someone has come in after me. Uh, that confers extra weight to that chain. Everybody will, will latch onto, onto the yellow person's uh, yellow, yellow microblocks. So if I continue as the blue, blue leader to issue additional blocks, it's going to have absolute, it's like creating an old fork. Nobody will, will respect it. So, um, okay, here we go. I just wanted to, uh, yeah, if I, uh, if I sort of, uh, if I refuse to, to respect the authority of this person and I keep on issuing, minting new, new stuff here, uh, it's, it's, it's like mining on an old block. Nobody cares. People will extend this one. Okay, so, uh, okay, I need, to be, I need to count how many clicks I'm pressing here. Uh, maybe there's a, no. Okay, so, um, so we set up our equations and just come up with the, the sort of the solution to this, and that gives us, uh, that gives us, um, okay, that gives us a, a good bound on, um, uh, it's a set of bounds that allows, uh, allow us to pick good parameters. Now, the next thing is, okay, well, what do we do? Um, so, you know, I guess what we could do is go fight it out with other people and say our protocol is better than others. But really what we did decided to do is we should come up with some metrics for evaluating consensus protocols. And some of the metrics are very, very straightforward and, and lend themselves like they're easy. But we should, you know, obviously, there's this thing called mining power utilization. And... Uh, I'll talk about these, these metrics in a second, actually. Um, so that's crucial fairness to miners. It's important. Consensus delay is pretty important. Uh, and time to win and time to prune. I don't have time to go into this, but essentially you need metrics to talk about the amount of skew in the network. Some miners are going to be far ahead of others in any kind of a distributed system, and you want to be able to sort of quantify just how many people are far ahead and how many people are coming be from behind. So, uh, so we came up with various different metrics for measuring these things, um, specifically for Nakamoto consensus protocols, but I think they apply universally to other, other protocols as well. So, so we did all this. Um, we then went the extra, extra mile, and um, we had about uh, 500 machines that were donated to us that were in our basement. And we built a large network emulation platform. So the goal was this thing called Miniature World. Um, the goal was to create a one-to-one -one replica of the Bitcoin network. There were only 8,000 nodes on the Bitcoin <coughs> network. Okay, so we have 500 machines with eight cores. You know, they have like 4,000 cores right there. And on 4,000 cores, I can run 8,000 8, processes and there, thereby emulate every single node one-to-one -one uh, in the basement. So, for example, if Drew is running a node in Philadelphia, there would have to be, there would be a, a Drew node uh, in, in Ithaca in the basement. And, and so now the next thing that you have to ask is, so how do you do the delay thing? So we spent a bunch of time uh, measuring the delays, the latency and delay between uh, the pairs of hosts in the, um, in the network. Now, finding the, 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 the delay between Drew and someone else when you don't control both Drew and that other person is difficult. So uh, the latency we can discover using a, a cute but trick. It doesn't have to be too accurate. Well, latency, I think we were fairly accurate on. Uh, and throughput, we couldn't directly discover the throughput, the pairwise throughput. Uh, but we, uh, we measured the throughput to each of the nodes from uh, enough from at least 10 different locations 
to find the provision bandwidth of that node, right? So is he connected to the world with 100 megabits or gigabit or whatever? And so, so I think we created a, a fairly decent replica <laughs> of, uh, of, the, of the world. And we also did this for Ethereum as well. So we ran some really long measurement studies. Um, I, I mention all this because it's really useful to do these things because they can actually, we can respond to any kind of a protocol evaluation challenge, right? So instead of Greg Maxwell fighting it out with George, Roger Ver or whatever, we can just have, look guys, give us your code, give us your other code, we'll just run it in the basement, see which one's better. Like, do, do we really see a difference? Like, this is actually easily, like, this is how science works. That's why the word science is up there. Um, so, uh, but the, the fight, the schism in the Bitcoin world was political. It had nothing to do with science. No matter what we had come up with, they wouldn't have taken. So, um, uh, but let me show you like, the right way to do it, I, what I believe is the right way to do it. And, uh, and, uh, and see, uh, see what you guys think. So, um, okay, so mining, mining power utilization is, uh, is simply, there are somehow, this thing has become white. It's sigma green blocks uh, divided by sigma green plus red. So, uh, uh, so if there are any orphans that are being lost, that's just lost power, and that's not good. It's, it corresponds to lost security. Is there a question? Andre? Is there a question? I'll take it if there's a question. If you have a question, there are probably other people who have questions, so, so speak up. No, no questions? I didn't mean to pick on you too hard, sorry. If I, but, uh, uh, but, but let me know if you have questions about this material. Okay, so um, uh, let's see. Fairness is, uh, this is an important metric for any Nakamoto-style protocol, which is for a set of miners, blue, red, and green, who have this much hash power, um, uh, or, or, yeah, who have this much hash power, they mine this many, how many of those blocks were on the main <coughs> chain? So typically what you end up seeing is people with, with large amounts of hash power are overrepresented, and people who have less hash power tend to incur more orphans. So we don't want this kind of a, a, <coughs> kind of a problem. We, we, don't, we, we want the gap between the, the sort of the fair presence and the actual presence to be as small as possible. Um, so, um, so we built this entire system. We did not quite get to the one-to-one -one vision that, we, that I wanted in the first place. Well, we built a one-to-six replica of the Bitcoin system. We collected all these latency measurements from Planet Lab nodes, as well as uh, Amazon nodes, and, uh, and we verified uh, block propagation. So uh, let's see. Um, I'm going to skip this. So this is an interesting graph. That shows, on the x-axis, it shows the block frequency. And on the y-axis, it shows fairness. And it's exactly as you would imagine, which is, as you make the blocks more and more frequent, at some point, the network just collapses. Why? Well, because they're coming so frequently that you don't even have time to react to somebody else. I'm just kind of, you know, I'm, I'm mining on, at some point, I'm just mining on my own blocks. <laughs> and I'm far ahead of everyone. Uh, and then you guys, so, you know, I have seen 50 blocks from Luba, but Luba has 70 of her own blocks. She's just sort of behind. She can't get her extra 20 blocks out to me. Of the 50 blocks I've seen from Luba, I can't take any of them because I myself am at block 70. I have gotten 50 of my blocks out. Luba is ignoring my 50 blocks because she's at block 70 of her own. I'm at block 70 of my own, and so we will both fracture and never really work on things together. So that's the most extreme case. Uh, oh, good question. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Good question. For this particular graph, we're looking at uh, miners uh, of different magnitude, of miners with different hash power. I skipped this slide. I should have mentioned it. So uh, this is the, the hash power distribution that we used. And, um, uh, and, and in this kind of a scenario, the people who incurred the losses are almost always the small miners. So the big guys are just chugging along, generating a lot. Yeah. Key blocks, key blocks, not micro blocks. And, and so it's going to be, I mean, just by construction, you can see that this has to rule over this, and it will, because it should come as no surprise. So, um, okay, so that's the, uh, I think this one is a bit, more, uh, a bit more useful, maybe. This is the mining power utilization. You can see that uh, as you make the blocks more and more frequent, um, Bitcoin itself starts getting forks and starts losing 
its abilities, it starts losing efficiency and it goes down and, and collapses at some point. And uh, these are error bars, by the way, and, and Bitcoin NG is just chugging along at, uh, at its usual pace. So uh, other metrics like consensus delay follow a similar, similar curve. Uh, let me show you this. So this block size, okay, so because this is a political topic, we scaled everything around so that the numbers that we displayed here could not be directly taken and compared and used in the block size debate. Okay, so these numbers are uh, artificially small, um, and, but they just scale up normally to, to, to one megabyte. So, uh, so the, the big block size debate was being fought around this. So this corresponds to about a megabyte size block when you scale everything up. So we made the block frequency more frequent, we made the blocks smaller. So uh, if you compensate for both, this corresponds to one megabyte. And the big fight was one megabyte versus, uh, versus two versus four. You can see that that entire discussion is literally in the noise, okay? So two plus years of craziness, DDoS attacks, people's careers being over and so forth, they're just arguing over noise. So we did not have to have that craziness. Science tells us that, you know, you can measure these things and really guys, uh, it's indiscernible, the difference between that and this point, is there's just no, no difference. But uh, the Bitcoin core folks are not wrong. If you really push the envelope, it does collapse. And Bitcoin NG does not by construction. Yep. Is there a point uh, farther away from the graph where, where it does collapse? Or? No. Um, no, Bitcoin, Bitcoin NG, um, no. Uh, but there is a point at which it stops, I guess, because... Uh, because the, the rate at which you're issuing uh, micro blocks ends up, you run into that limit, right? So uh, if you make that too frequent, then you will end up losing, losing bandwidth. So, yes? And uh, NG, these, uh, these are the sizes of the micro blocks? Uh, no. Or the yeah, 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 yes, 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 sorry, yes, yes. This is the cumulative size of all micro blocks put together between average blocks. Yep. Great. Yeah. The reason why it's more fair is because instead of getting into this frantic mode over a very small time frame, we have a much more relaxed um, uh, time frame. We've smeared block creation over a longer time frame. It's a less competitive episode. Yeah, every 10 minutes, right? And, uh, uh, and then that competition is resolved within a few seconds. And if you try to do it with big blocks to get as much data every, every 10 minutes the Bitcoin way, then it gets resolved over the course of a minute. And then, of course, forks begin to creep up. Okay, so uh, how am I doing on time? We need to stop at, uh, at half past? I think so. You, you mm. minutes. Okay, so you know what I'm going to do then? I'm not going to rush through the rest of this. Um, I'm, I was going to talk about off-chain scaling I'm going to do that tomorrow morning, and then I'll talk about the DAO hack. We're going to go up one more notch, and we'll talk about what it means to have a secure smart contract, um, what happened with the DAO, how it should have been resolved, and so forth. Yes? Mm. So everybody knows now that this guy is a leader, so adversaries could, could attack him. That's, that is a weakness with NG. Okay. So at the network layer, um, the, the leader has to take action to try to hide his identity. But that is also true in the Bitcoin world. So if you actually kind of make yourself known as a miner, people will actually attack you. The other miners will attack you to make you less efficient. And hackers will try to attack you to steal your coins. I actually have a funny story about this. How many people here have heard of Christian Decker? Okay, so Christian Decker is one of the, the earliest uh, graduate students who got into Bitcoin mining. He was miner number, miner number five or something on the Bitcoin network. Um, he was a graduate student at ETH Zurich. And uh, he mined 9,220 Bitcoins, so about 10,000 Bitcoins, which is a lot of money. So he was doing his PhD studies 
and uh, Bitcoin was doing its meteoric rise, and he thought, hey, you know, I'm making a lot of money, life is going to be great after graduation. Um, and then he made the mistake of building a Bitcoin relay network to facilitate the transmission of blocks. So, um, so when you do that, to other people, it appears as if you are the big source of every block, right? You are this guy who, m more often than not, because you run this fast hardware, you're the guy who's giving them, giving them blocks. So that made him a target. And, uh, and so these hackers uh, carried out a very complicated operation uh, to, to jump into his, first his work machine, from his work machine to his home machine, from his home router, rather, to his home router, from his home router to the second router, that was the second layer of security, and then from there to his, his actual home box, and they stole all of his, uh, all of his coins. Uh, if you talk to him, he's remarkably cool about having lost 10,000 bitcoins, and, uh, and uh, they have this, uh, at the ETH, they have this um, tradition uh, at the PhD defenses of, of everybody asking him questions and, and his, his friends made, made fun of him mercilessly for, uh, for having lost so much money, uh, for having made it and then having lost it. Um, in any case, so let me, uh, let me maybe show you a few other things around this topic. So everything else kind of plays out the way you would expect with Bitcoin NG. It's sort of a sensible thing to do. Uh, since this paper has been out, this idea has been adopted in at least uh, four, maybe five different chains. So Eternity is using it, Waves is using it, and uh, a couple of Cypherium is using it, and a couple of others are using it right now. So, um, so this is sort of our starting point, and I think this is the sensible way in which you kind of want to build a new Nakamoto consensus protocol. If you had to do it today, I think this is, this is much better. Um, if only for the reason that, that uh, you know, forget throughput, the latency is much, much better, right? So regular Bitcoin would give you, you would have a zero confirmation transaction, which is a meaningless thing. It just kind of sits there. You can't really take action on it. Whereas with this, um, the time to first confirmation is very, very quick, right? You're at the coffee house. You want to buy coffee. You issue your transaction. Within a few seconds, the current leader signs it. And sure, it's not quite binding. Sure, it's not buried six deep but it is nevertheless incorporated into the current block. So that's a pretty good thing to have. The latency of this protocol is much better than others. So following this work, um, we did some additional stuff that uh, looked at uh, how you might scale and we're continuing to do work along this direction, which is uh, to, to observe the following. This whole NG structure is actually very nice. We have these these microtransactions and a key block and a bunch of microtransactions and a key block and so forth. So one, one way in which you could use this to your advantage is to, is to do this. You could use these key blocks to secure more than one series of microtransactions. So take your regular chain, and your regular chain has a lot of things going on in it, and uh, create a second parallel chain. So suppose these are Bitcoin transactions. Add another chain of microtransactions that correspond to something that's naturally sharded, and that's something that's naturally separate. For example, these might be real estate transactions. These might be domain name transactions, and so on and so forth, such that these key blocks now secure all of these chains in parallel. If we're going to melt the polar ice caps for Bitcoin mining, why not get additional mileage from them and uh, secure a whole bunch of chains at the same time with the same infrastructure? So this was an idea that, was, that we called Aspen, and uh, all of the incentivization, of course, works the same way. Uh, the payment rail ends up paying for, you know, incentivizing for this stuff, and then these guys are essentially kind of free riders uh, that ride along with the, with the main chain. So, um, uh, so at the moment, we are uh, we're looking at sharding the payment rail, again, using the NG idea, such that you know, people whose names start with A to Z or whatever, addresses that start with 0 to, to 8 are up here, you know, 8 to F are here, or something like that. That's just two shards. Typically, you'd want to have many more. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, you can then, uh, then coordinate what's happening. OK. So. Uh, so what's my real, uh, real sort of message here? Well, 
Reparameterizing things takes us only so far. How far does it take? It takes us actually quite far. <laughs> Ask Charlie Lee, who took Bitcoin, reparameterized it, and then and ended up with something called Litecoin and made billions of dollars. So, you know, it takes some people very far. Um, but uh, as a system architect, uh, it doesn't really take us that far when it comes to throughput. And um, so what did we do? Well, so we came up with a new, new scheme for structuring this thing where you take Bitcoin's Nakamoto consensus, turn it upside down on its head, get the incentives just right, and, uh, and if you do that, you end up having a system that has exactly the same trust model as Bitcoin. If, if you liked Bitcoin, then you have to like this. Same miners, same structure, same infrastructure. So, uh, so that's great. And it gives you uh, an enormous improvement in latency and a substantial improvement in throughput with the one caveat of potentially uh, identifying yourself somewhat on well, paying, having to pay attention to not identify yourself on the, on the network. That, that's it's sort of the, the linchpin. Um, and uh, so in addition to do, doing this, we derived metrics, built an emulation platform and so forth. And uh, so, you know, the younger folks over here, um, I typically find it very difficult to motivate my students to, to measure things, but it is crucial. And, uh, and it, it plays an enormous role in, in building systems. So, um, okay, and I want to leave you with this question then, and I'll talk about this tomorrow. So this kind of a jump up in, uh, in, uh, in throughput is good. So we went from three transactions per second. So if I add one to two orders of magnitude, so from three to you know, 30 to 300 transactions per second. So that's good, but it's not quite Google scale. I can't really compete with Visa. I need a few, few more orders of magnitude over here. So, uh, so I think tomorrow morning I'll talk about how we go off chain and get like five more orders of, four more orders of magnitude by going off chain. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, yes. In terms of the, what is the bottleneck? Um, I think the real bottleneck has to be, at the end of the day, your minimum viable platform. So uh, uh, the rate at which you issue your microtransactions has to be such that your minimum slowest node is able to keep up with this validation. So uh, it's kind of odd, but many, especially Bitcoin uh, developers, have been shying away from defining that platform. Um, but if you're going to do this, you have to have in mind, like, what is it that you're targeting? Is it an Apple iWatch? Is it a Raspberry Pi? Is it a you know, regular laptop? Or what, what, there has to be some machine uh, that you're happy with. There has to be some space consumption per year that you're happy with. So define that. That then determines the throughput limit. So uh, somehow Bitcoin folks have not done this. They, they refuse. And they don't typically, I mean, despite all the noise they make, I haven't been able to, to get them to, to sort of engage scientifically. Um, if you don't have a limit, if you don't have a definition of your minimum viable platform, then I don't know how to derive many of these other metrics. So it's been a kind of a, it's one of the reasons why I've, I've cooled off of Bitcoin quite a bit because of these interactions. I really tried hard to get that community to see the value of scientific approach to system design. And at some point I decided these people are more interested in power than they are interested in building something. So, uh, but that's me. Um, yes? Ah. Right. So the miners, by virtue of selecting transactions, they're doing a whole lot of other things as well, right? So they're managing, for example, the growth of the UTXO set. And um, at some point, miners used to prefer transactions that get rid of dust, or rather small amounts of outputs uh, that, um, that sort of occupy space. So uh, that's the kind of good that miners can do. 
Um, let's see. Um, there are uh, miners used to also uh, measure who, who in the, you know, which of the transactions is moving coins that haven't moved in the longest time. So if you are sitting on some really, so you're Satoshi, and you want to spend some coins from block number two, um, you know, they would prioritize that uh, versus you, who's a day trader, who's constantly buying and selling things. So um, all of these ideas were <laughs> abandoned. And uh, uh, at some point, as sort of mining became much more of a sort of an economically driven cutthroat activity, uh, people just sort of started doing whatever pays the most. So uh, that's why I tried to, I wanted to push that discussion to the end because it's a deep topic. So things that you and I can think of that, that seem like great ideas for the system um, are not necessarily easy to motivate uh, from a profit perspective. And once the profit side, you know, side of things comes into play, then you go into this other mode. So, so I, I hear you that you have a lot of cool ideas about what you want to add into that prioritization function. Sadly, the miners are out there, they're not going to listen to you. They're going to be like, yeah, he's got some cool ideas, but this guy pays more, and I'm going to take this. Right, value, right, but value to whom is the question? Ah, if it has value to miner, they're going to uh, include it immediately. Uh, uh, but, but you have also swap, so basically you will have a trade-off. So for instance, possibly you will have a uh, smaller value, but bigger swap, and uh, or a bigger value and a smaller swap, you know, uh, and uh, you have a trade-off. Yeah. You, you can actually, uh, you can actually uh, make some incentives to implement some latency guarantees also. You don't need... I, I hear you. I, I agree, I agree. So my, my, as I said, you and I will get excited about this. Um, then you have to turn around to the Chinese miner who just recently purchased, you know, let's say $100 million worth of these weird rigs and tell him, uh, you know, here's a transaction. It pays one Bitcoin to you right now. Here's another transaction that pays 0.5, but this is better. It, has, it carries more value for the system. Mine this one, not that one. And he's, he doesn't seem to be listening to those. No, so, but, uh, but again, I say the piece that he will get will correspond to the value of transaction. Possibly there is oh, misunderstanding. But where are they? Oh, I see, I see. I see. You want to change the way that the system rewards you yeah, exactly. out of the, from the minting pool. Yeah, no, I'm down with that. That's an exciting, interesting direction. Um, I agree, I agree. So you could, uh, you could tie. So, there, so that's an interesting direction. So um, if you could somehow characterize uh, goodness, social good, maintain, you know, uh, created by the miner, and uh, and rewarded the miner appropriately. That would be good. There are also other tricks since we're talking about NG and selfish mining as well. Um, so Bitcoin is very myopic in how it rewards people. So uh, you could easily look at a long chain, and then average over the goodness done in that chain, right? So. Um, uh, so there are various different problems, so you know, it's a little complicated to get into them right now. But there are various different problems that protocol designers uh, see, and quite a few of them are solvable by, by rewarding across time. So you don't just say, you get, you get whatever fees are in your block. I just say, I look backwards for 100 blocks at the you know, 13 people who mine those, those 100 blocks, and then I divide everything that happened according to a set schedule. So those are all on the table if you want to design your own coin. Uh, yeah, so you could, you could mint according to social good achieved. You could mint uh, and measure that across a longer time frame. Both are on the table. Okay, yes? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, get, you have embezzlement, internal debt. Uh, and breakage, I don't have a good example, but for example, uh, coin based transactions command a premium versus regular Bitcoin. Yeah, they do, yeah. Uh, 
Um, I'm not sure. I've never seen them modeled. They certainly exist. You're absolutely right. Um, so I think what we're doing is we're taking whatever may have happened in Bitcoin and simulating it in NG. So, um, uh, so at the end of the day, those sorts of internal errors and so forth are nowhere to be seen. When we are going so in the basement, yeah, we're just going solely by what we saw on the blockchain. Um, but that's an interesting question, right? So if you really wanted to model exactly what's going on in the world, you'd have to have insight into what's happening in the backend systems of the miners, which I don't have, have insight into. Um, and uh, uh, yes, and there are other measurement data collection techniques that we contemplated but did not perform, which would answer your question maybe a little bit. Um, for example, you could infiltrate every mining pool look around possibly at other people, what they're doing, and uh, because some of them are open about who mined how much, and see how much mining is going where. Is somebody turned off for some reason, and so on and so forth. And so we did not do that kind of detailed internal data collection. Is there data for mean time between failure for mining hardware? Yes, there is. There, there, are, there, is, there is more than a million <coughs> units that have been sold. So that data uh, certainly exists at the miners. It's a little hard to get at it as an academic, but if you have friends, they can actually tell you. Yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of statistical data by now. So people have been running these things for a long time. Okay, so I think, oh yes, yes, Andre. Six key blocks, just like normal. So I still need to wait like one hour to... Yes. If, yes, yes. So just like Itai Abraham was saying before, if you want the security of, uh, of an hour of Bitcoin hashing, you have to wait for uh, an hour of Bitcoin hashing, which corresponds to six key blocks. So that doesn't change. The, that latency doesn't change. But um, if you wanted to take, you know, if you wanted quick payments, that changes. So you, normally I would have, so suppose I'm selling coffee to you. You give me a transaction, I'd give you the coffee, hoping that you don't double spend on me. Because I see a transaction from you, but I don't know if it's going to go into a block at all. Uh, with Bitcoin NG, um, essentially, I'm, when the miner mints the block, so mints the micro block, when the miner takes my, the, the transaction you gave me and puts it on the micro blockchain, essentially, I have something slightly lower than one confirmation, but something that's much better than zero confirmation. So that, that latency goes down immensely. So, uh, so normally Bitcoin would have one confirmation at 10 minutes. We have 0.9 confirmation at two seconds. That, that's the big, big improvement. But if you want the security of six confirmation, that doesn't change because it's six, six key blocks. Okay, yeah. Right. And in that case, like, is it even a really big issue? Like, if I buy a copy and it, I know it's in the mempool and the transaction fees are high enough, like, you can trust that it will eventually get on the, on the chain? It will not eventually get on the chain. Uh, there is no guarantee that it There's will. No guarantee, but like, in practice, the risk for, compared to the value. YOLO design, right? So, <laughs> like, it probably will get into the chain, but it might not, right? Correct, you cannot, yeah. right. Um, so it depends on, on how much risk you want to take. So zero conf transactions come with risk assessment. So you can, uh, uh, you'll have to look at who's paying you for how much and whether you're comfortable with the risk. Y yes, Gail, I'll... Yeah, maybe it's a bit off topic, but you said something that you've been faced when facing a blockchain and not in the best model. Using what? What did I say? Using what? Fees. 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 I saw, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Okay, I can. Um, okay, so this is, this is right up your alley, your, up your alley, alley. so uh, th this particular part. So um, this is a different topic, so this is something else that we're looking at. Every single blockchain um, does the following thing. It, it essentially has some limited throughput, right? It's essentially, it's going to be 
creating some data structure. Space on that data structure is, is precious, and um, uh, what they all do is, um, uh, is sell it to the highest bidder. If you do that, then you are subject to all of the vagaries, all of the difficulties of first price auctions. And first price auctions, we know, uh, incite strategic behavior. So, you know, this transaction is really worthwhile to me. It's a uh, hundred bucks worth, but everybody else is paying five bucks. Why don't I bid for seven and da 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 da? And so suddenly you have these weird strategic behaviors um, and, uh, and it doesn't lead to good outcomes. So as in, sometimes I underbid, it's suddenly a new flurry of transactions come in, my $7 bid is too low, then I have to do other crazy things, my transaction is not getting confirmed. So, um, uh, so, so there is that problem. There is another problem with the transaction fees, which is estimating them is pretty much impossible. Okay, and so people used to estimate them using uh, simple algorithms. So something, if I ask you guys, how would you estimate them? You know, you're all fairly smart. I, might, you know, I thought I was smart, so my initial gut reaction would have been, I would look backwards to see how much other people are paying, and then I would pay accordingly. Does that make sense to people? Yes? Okay, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> Why? Well, okay, let's take the, the following scenario. Uh, we, we were doing this, and fees were zero dollars. Suddenly, there was a flurry of activity. CryptoKitties went viral. And, you know, we are all putting in, like, you know, $100 worth of fees. And so we ratcheted it up. And, so, and then now CryptoKitties are no longer used at all, but our history is full of $100 fees. So, uh, so the prices ratchet up, and then they don't come down. So that was a bad, bad fee selection algorithm. So Bitcoin suffered from this quite, quite badly as well. So, um, so almost, not all, every coin gets this wrong. And uh, there are much better ways of structuring this. I think I should shut up and let the students do their talks, yeah? I don't know who's in charge of the next session. Who's in charge of the next session? There is no next session? You're in charge, but... What? Okay, oh, okay, but there is a session, yes? Yes, yes, okay, come up, come up. Okay, thank you all.